So our first speaker today is going to be Ivy Anderson from the University of California's California Digital Library. She'll report on the Scope 3 project. And next we have John Oletti and uh, Gerald Frankel uh, who will talk about the Free the Science program from uh, ECS, the Electro Electrochemical Society. And then Christian Zimmerman, an economist, is here to critique the models uh, discussed in the first two um, portions. So about 15 minutes a piece for those sections and then 15 minutes for questions and answers, we hope. And I hope you, I hope you enjoy the broadcast. Okay, Ivy. Thank you, David. Let me just share my screen here. And hopefully go into presentation mode. Can everyone see my screen? Great, thank you. So thanks for inviting me to be part of this uh, session. Um, just a little bit about myself. This, this uh, uh, part of the discussion is about the Scope 3 uh, project to transform uh, high energy physics journals to open access. I've been involved in this project since uh, a fairly early period. UC was the first US institution to join the Scope 3 initiative, and I've been part of the uh, governing and executive uh, groups uh, since that time. So that's why one reason why I'm presenting today. Um, so Scope 3, if you're not familiar with it, is an uh, initiative to convert high energy physics journals to open access by redirecting subscription funds. And so the focus of this talk will be on the business model and financial aspects uh, of Scope 3, but I will go through some of the history and um, sort of status of the initiative. Uh, but let's start with the business model. So um, the way Scope 3 works, um, researchers uh, submit articles to journals just as they do in any and have done for, for a long time. No change in researcher workflows from that perspective. Um, CERN, the um, uh, Center for uh, Re Nuclear Research uh, in Europe based in Geneva, Switzerland, is the administrative home of Scope 3. So CERN manages contracts with publishers and uh, has negotiated contracts with publishers to publish the high energy physics articles that are submitted as open access. The publishers in turn have uh, agreed to reduce the subscription or license fees for uh, two libraries uh, commensurate with the proportion of high energy physics publishing in those journals. Some, some of the journals that are converted through scope three are 100% high energy physics. Some of them are only a percentage of high energy physics but it's the high energy physics uh, articles that are, that are reduced. So subscription fees to libraries are reduced. Libraries then pay membership fees to Scope 3, which is administered by CERN uh, for the benefit of Scope 3. Uh, and in this way, existing subscription funds or license fees um, are redirected and utilized with, um, in, in many cases, no need to increase expenditures beyond uh, uh, the subscription funds that were previously paid to publishers for subscription access. Um, libraries do not have to engage in any explicit operations to make this happen. There is a component of Scope 3 in which funding agencies also provide some financial support in some countries, and that's very much country dependent. Uh, and then all of the material that's published in this way is published as open access. So for the um, author, the scholar, the researcher, there's no change in behavior. There are no direct costs that are borne by the researchers, uh, but researchers retain copyright and have all of the benefits uh, of open access, as does the uh, community as a whole. So a little bit about the timeline uh, of Scope 3. Uh, Scope 3 spent uh, quite a bit of time developing its business model and building support in the community. So um, there was about a decade of pre-work to develop the Scope 3 model. Um, it started in 2005-06 uh, with the uh, idea uh, among uh, high energy physics researchers, largely, uh, although not exclusively, based in CERN and the um, particle accelerator uh, community there. Um, in the next few years, a working party uh, was uh, put together to design a business model and develop the plans for Scope 3. Uh, after that, there was a phase of consensus building uh, globally within the community. There was uh, an expression of interest document that institutions were asked to sign to signal their interest in moving in this direction and help build momentum towards a global flip to open access. 
uh, uh, a little bit later than uh, after that in the 2012-2013 uh, time frame, there was a lot of uh, startup work to uh, issue a tender or request for proposal, as we would think of it in the U.S., uh, for publishers to submit proposals to convert their journals to Scope 3. And this, again, was something that CERN uh, administered on behalf of the community. Um, there was a steering committee that developed a memorandum of understanding and a governance structure. And then it, by 2014, the project was ready to launch. So the first operational phase of Scope 3 uh, began in 2014 uh, with 10 journals from six publishers. Uh, seven of those journals are published by or on behalf of or co-published with uh, academic societies, scientific societies. Um, and we are um, now in the second phase of Scope 3, the extension from 2017 through 2019. The first phase was a three-year commitment. We're now uh, in the second three-year commitment. Uh, two uh, journals uh, left the partnership, but American Physical Society journals will be joining the partnership in 2018. And of course, we expect Scope 3 to continue uh, beyond this period. So at the start of Scope Three, when we were ready to go to become an operational concern, there were 15 countries plus CERN at, in December uh, 2013. Uh, by December 2016, by the end of the first phase, there were 44 countries um, and also three intergovernmental organizations <clears throat> that were participating in Scope 3. So, so there has been steady uh, and significant growth over the period that the partnership has been uh, in place. You can see that there are some regions of the globe that uh, where we're still working to build community and support, um, but there has been a very a substantial and significant and um, uh, uh, good uh, growth over the, the last three years. Uh, so what does scope three look like from an operational perspective or from a, a an impact perspective? Um, it, it has converted in its first phase um, uh, about half of the uh, high energy physics literature through the 10 journals that were participating at that time. Uh, this is a, very, a, a community that publishes a great deal. So uh, uh, over 13,000 articles were published uh, as open access during that first three year period uh, at a cost of uh, over the three years of a little under uh, 14 million euros. So um, something under uh, 5 million uh, euros per year. Um, the average cost per article or investment per article is a little over a thousand euros per year over the three year uh, period, or excuse me, a thousand uh, euros per article over the three year period. So that's uh, arrived at a very good uh, cost um, le level for the partnership. Um, just a little bit more on the, the art per article cost for Scope 3. Um, this slide is a little bit uh, hard perhaps to uh, navigate, but what it uh, what it demonstrates is a comparison of the scope three cost per article to uh, cost per articles that other APC uh, initiatives have been uh, publicizing and disclosing. Uh, at, at the um, articles average ar article payments by Wellcome Trust, for example, about 2,600 euros. Uh, average UK higher education. Um, uh, cost per article is about 2,400. These are APC uh, figures that these uh, uh, countries and, and organizations have released. Uh, in Austria, 2,300 uh, euros per article, um, et cetera. And you can see that scope three is very much at the lower end of that scale at uh, about 1,000 euros per article. What you can also see on the left-hand side of this chart is that there's uh, some correlation between the cost of articles of each of the scope three journals and their impact factors. So you can see there's a trend line where um, the higher the impact factor in general, the, uh, the, the higher the cost and the lower impact factor journals have a, are at the lower uh, end of the spectrum. And that was partly a result of the a tender process that Scope 3 undertook when it started out to develop a, 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 an algorithm or a, me a mechanism for awarding contracts to publishers based on uh, a combination of factors that included both quality and cost. Um, when APS joins in 2018, Scope 3 will 
then as of 2018 cover 87% of the HEP literature. So a very significant portion of the HEP literature will be covered with uh, the joining of, of APS in 2018. Um, and that's um, a, a very, we're, we're very, very, very pleased uh, at that development. Um, Scope 3 also spent a lot of time in the startup phase developing a governance structure to make sure that there was good governance and oversight of this initiative. So um, as I mentioned, CERN serves as the administrative home of Scope 3, um, but there's a, a governing council in which every a member country participates. Um, there is an executive committee that works closely with CERN on day-to-day -day, uh, oversight. Um, there are various working groups on outreach, on auditing, financial auditing, and so forth. Um, so there's a very um, a, a very robust governance structure for Scope 3. Um, it's also, I would say, when we get later into the discussion, one of the challenges of this kind of, init kind of initiative is how many of these kinds of governance structures can one participate in, because there's a certain amount of obligation that goes with this kind of governance, but it's uh, very uh, successful in terms of participation of the community in governance. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, funding and sustainability, since that's really our uh, topic today, a little bit more on those, about those components. So the distribution of costs across countries, Scope 3 is organized at a country level primarily, and the costs per country are allocated according to the volume of high energy physics publishing. So there's an interesting dynamic between the redirection of subscription funds and the allocation of costs across the country based on publishing output. Those are two slightly different mechanisms. When APS joins, the, the country shares will change a bit again, again because of the distribution of publishing across, across the globe. So that's how country shares are designed uh, under the Scope 3 model. Um, different countries have used different mechanisms to gather funding to participate in Scope 3. As I said, the participation is at a country level, and so each country has had to determine how it can self-organize to provide uh, and collect the funding for Scope 3. Um, in many countries, there is a single point of contact, maybe a national level consortium of some sort, um, such as in Canada, the CRKN consortium serves as a national contact point for, for Canada. Um, so those are the very dark purple uh, areas. The lighter purple, purple areas are countries where there are a number of consortia that participate collectively and have to uh, organize themselves collectively to participate. So the US is in that category, uh, Australia is in that category. Um, there are several countries that participate purely through an intergovernmental organization. So um, uh, there are several inter uh, IGOs that uh, are, operate in this area that support uh, Scope 3. Um, there are a number of countries where funding agencies are explicitly participating in Scope 3 to support and supplement the funding that's coming from libraries. So that's true, for example, in the UK um, and in China as well. Um, and um, other countries, uh, there are other countries where there is um, the, the publishing is essentially subvented by the member countries, and those are these orange areas where these countries are not participating directly, but their publishing is collectively supported by the members that do participate. Um, as over time, as the funding has uh, been uh, aggregating uh, in the very early phase of the partnership, CERN, provided a significant subsidy to get Scope 3 started. So you can see that a lot of the funding was provided by CERN, and this is something that CERN's Finance Committee had to approve, so there's a very formal process for this. <clears throat> now, as the partnership has grown, the need for a CERN subsidy has shrunk significantly, and we expect that to, um, to continue to decline over time as more uh, uh, countries participate. Um, we do think that funding agencies will continue to be a part of the sustainability mix for Scope 3, so that in those countries where funding organizations are participating, we imagine that that, that, that will continue and be a, a permanent feature of uh, this kind of collaborative model. Uh, as from the individual library perspective, I think this will differ in different countries, but certainly for us at CDL, we've seen cost control through Scope 3 that we not, would not have had through our subscription licenses. Had those journals uh, remained in the subscription licenses, they would have uh, seen 
a much more significant inflation than we have seen under scope three, which has been able to exercise very good cost control through its global contracts. And the final thing I wanted to say about scope three is that it's served as a model and, and an inspiration for a number of other collaborative initiatives, even ones that don't operate like scope three um, have been inspired by the notion of a global cooperative, the possibility that one can in fact successfully globally collaborate to flip journals. And so the Open Library of the Humanities, a very different kind of initiative, has uh, referred to scope three as an inspiration and a model because we demonstrated that global collaboration was possible. A similarly, a, a new initiative that is just getting off the ground, Libraria in uh, the anthropological and social sciences has also looked to scope three as a model for a consortial approach to a collaborative funding of, of open access. So um, that's scope three in a nutshell and um, thanks for your time and let's uh, turn it back to um, our next speaker. Thanks, Ivy. So, uh, John is up. Very good. Um, so um, I'm John Aletti. I'm a faculty member at the University of Iowa. I'm president of the Electrochemical Society. The Electrochemical Society is an international organization. Over half of our members come from outside North America. Uh, we have about 8,000 members. We have two peer-reviewed journals, the Journal of Electrochemical Society and the ECS Journal of Solid State Science and Technology. We ha also have um, a house organ um, interface, and we have the Electrochemical Society transactions where various types of content are um, reported. Uh, it is our mission to disseminate science and, and technical information. That is what we do. Um, and so I am here today to talk to you a little bit about um, open access. Um, and then uh, after, I'm sorry, I'm here to talk to you about open science. And then after that, um, uh, my colleague, Jerry Frankel, who is a technical editor for the Journal of Electrochemical Society, will talk more specifically about open access and the models evolving at ECS to support open access, including free the science. So, um, so open access is a broad term encompassing many views and direction. Uh, it includes open access, open data, open reproducible research, open science evaluation, open science policies, and open science tools. Um, and it's, it's evolving from the notion that if research and scientific methods are predicated on logical knowledge-based inquiry, then access to the information that feeds the process is required. Uh, when tax dollars go from grants to pay for research, then the obligation to free the science and report it in an open manner is yet greater. Within the open science, within open science, the where, the when, the how to make the information open is an evolving question. ECS just op hosted uh, it, uh, Satellite OpenCon, which is the first uh, to be hosted by a scientific society. And some of the players in the science, open science movement include SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Research Coalition, which is a global coalition to make open the default for research and education. They adv advocate and advance open access, open data, and open education. The Center for Open Science is a nonprofit technology organization with a mission to increase the openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research. And COS builds platforms for open dissemination of research. The federal government and foundations like the Gate Foundation and the Arnold Foundation promote and often require open access for publications arising from their support. The concepts of open science encompass much. Um, various mechanisms extant and proposed to disseminate science and research in open formats. Open science encompasses endorsement of open access. Open science rejects the for-profit publishers that exploit our science and research to return 30% annual to, annually to their investors. Open science rejects the journal impact factor, which only looks at citations in the last two years. And so the impact factor is defined as, quote, dividing all citations to the journal in the current journal citation reports year to items published in the previous two years, divided by the total number of scholarly documents published in the journal in the previous two years. And that's taken from the journal citations report in 2017. Um, the for-profit publishers have you know, exploited the impact factor for commercial benefit, and it's not even clear that the impact factor actually is a reasonable metric for um, scientific uh, processing of information. Um, and in the process of exploiting the impact factor, uh, the for-profit publishers have driven most of the not-for-profit and societal publishers out of the publication enterprise. 
When, when publications are driven by profit rather than scientific advance, the review process is in danger of compromise, and the review process is pivotal to what we do as researchers and scientists. Rigorous peer review is the means by which our research is vetted, research is advanced, and funding is awarded. If the research is reviewed with an eye jaundiced by profit, then is the review reliable? Much relies on the review. The for-profit publishers are taxing scientific inquiry at all levels. There are exorbitant prices for the journals published by libraries. There are exorbitant prices, prices for publishing papers open access. This is borne by the authors and it is charged grants. There is exploitation of the researcher's time, which is paid for by grants, universities, and businesses to review the papers for the for-profit publishers. Exclusion of researchers from research content if they don't have a subscription for the for-profit journals is an unnecessary burden and not appropriate. And it is particularly difficult for small companies and parts of the world where support for research is limited. Exorbitant charges for permission to use figures copyrighted by the for-profit publishers are also active. Uh, funding levels are generally not increasing and the cost to publish papers in for-profit journals is escalating and consuming funds that might have otherwise gone to support new research. Free open access may be the answer. I will uh, turn to Jerry Frankel who will talk about the ECS, how ECS is working to address open access publications and the ECS Free the Science campaign. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. And my name is Jerry Frankel. I'm a professor at Ohio State University in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And I'm one of the technical editors on the Journal of the Electrochemical Society. So John had talked about uh, the for-profit publishers, and maybe I'm speaking to the choir here, but uh, preaching to the choir. But these, these uh, publishers have created a lot of pressure on society publications. John has said a lot of them have just gone out of the business. So they're squeezing library budgets with their high-cost uh, packages that where they bundle together. Uh, journals that people want and some they don't want. They drive the impact factor mania, as John had talked about. And they end up publishing bad papers and rejecting good ones because of what they perceive will get, uh, get citations. It's really just so ironic that in, in this day and age where so much information is available, uh, you know, at the click of a button, that the cost of receiving scientific literature has skyrocketed. So the Electrochemical Society a few years ago did a bunch of soul searching, right? So how, how to deal with this? We, uh, you know, we could have sold out to one of the for-profit publishers like a lot of societies did, but we decided this was really counter to our values of disseminating information broadly. Uh, you know, so we started this uh, Free the Science initiative, which encompasses open science and open access. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk primarily now about open access, and one of the things we wanted to do was to support some parts of our society that do really good science, even though they're not, you know, hot topics. So we, uh, a lot of our society is really deeply engaged with hot topics, like, like batteries, for instance, and there are others like my area, which is corrosion, which is really important to all kinds of things, but not as, as, as hot. So the world is moving to open access. You know, there are these mandates that John had talked about. Um, and basically the societies decided to take this very bold step of moving to what we call platinum open access. So platinum open access is really like scope three, free to authors, free to readers. But uh, we don't have this big community, as Ivy talked about, where people would pitch in together. And uh, basically, to deal with the real costs involved in article processing and archiving, what we're trying to do is to use development to generate funds in a kind of endowment that would support the ongoing activities. So for now, we have APCs. Uh, they're very low, $200 per article for a member, $800 for a non-member. And there are lots of uh, free publications. Each member gets an, one annual credit. Uh, as well as focus issues are published open access, critical reviews, editor's choice, some other special types of, of, uh, of articles. So a lot, something like 30% of the journal is now open access. We are still maintaining our very high quality standards, very strong peer review process with uh, useful and timely reviews. And I think that we have a very positive author experience. That's, that's part of what we offer. But I want to talk in the, in the few minutes remaining with the problems 
the problems that we're facing, the problems with the journal going to this platinum open access. Uh, one thing is that, it, is that the development activities are difficult. It's been hard to, to find the kind of support that we are uh, going to need to go to the full platinum free app open access. There are also some issues with the buy-ins from, uh, from authors. So uh, part of it has been, uh, well, at the beginning there's confusion with the, with the many new low quality for-profit open access journals and they showed up at the bottom there of Ivy's uh, chart. Uh, so, you know, we're, we, I, get, I get emails all the time from these journals asking for, for papers, uh, and they don't say what their APCs are. Uh, and the authors are not buying in fully. Part is the decision of where to publish, right? So, so uh, the, the decision primarily these days is driven by impact factor. But authors also want a large number of citations, so there's a balance between the possibility of more citations with an open access publication versus the prestige of publishing in a higher impact factor journal. Okay? And that connection of open access with higher citation count is real, but the studies that have been made have shown that, the, that it's generally small for now, larger apparently in the life and, and, and biological sciences than in the engineering sciences that, that we are part of. And, and we're tracking that now, uh, and it's, you know, it takes some time, but, and we see, we do see small effects, not very large effects. Um, one of the issues is a remuneration that authors receive for publishing in high impact journals in, in certain uh, places, certain countries, they're, they're getting money. And so that's a strong motivation. And then there's a cost. So, uh, you know, publishing is free in, in most journals if it's not open access. Um, and the article processing uh, charge is very low at ECS, but it's non-zero unless you have one of those categories that I, that I already mentioned. Um, and, and finally, there are some other factors that come into play. Some authors, I, I believe, agree with the society values. They want to support the Free the Science initiative and, and open access and that motivates them to, uh, to publish their work open access. And then there's this issue of mandates from funding agencies, uh, which is more aggressive in Europe. The whole, the whole I think, uh, endeavor is, has been driven more in Europe. Uh, so, you know, Ivy showed prices in, in euros even, not in dollars, right? Uh, and in Europe, actually this past week, there was a lot in the news about German researchers resigning from uh, Elsevier editorial boards in protest of, of uh, you know, the, the uh, contracts that they're trying to negotiate. So, uh, in, so there are these mandates that exist in Europe. They're, they are uh, in place now in the United States and it's going to take some time for them to impact the, uh, uh, the publications that are coming out of, of those uh, contracts. So there are uh, lots of issues. I, I think that uh, the society, the uh, Electrochemical Society, is, is really all in on this uh, free to science uh, effort, which includes open access. And I think it's in it for the, for the right reasons. Uh, but it's going to be some work for us to make it happen. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Jerry. So we'll turn to uh, Christian if you wouldn't mind giving us some perspective from uh, an economist's viewpoint. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Christian Zimmerman and I'm an economist here at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis. And uh, the reason why I, I was probably called on this is not that you didn't need a banker, it's rather that uh, I'm uh, involved uh, with, in, in REPEC, uh, as you see here, uh, which is uh, an open uh, bibliography uh, for economics. And uh, economics is a little bit particular uh, in the sense that we have a very active preprint uh, culture that we call working papers uh, that um, has started long ago and in some sense is, is acting like a, a substitute uh, for open access. We have rather few open access journals. However, we have this, uh, this culture of, of working papers. And uh, the goal of REPEC has been 
to enhance the dissemination of research and economics because these uh, these preprints didn't have the kind of channels that print journals had where I mean, uh, subscription uh, packages and such that that would get them into libraries uh, these the, these working papers needed a different avenue and and one thing uh, that that we, we, we've learned is that we we can create here a, a, a working culture uh, that is very active uh, uh, at extremely low cost. Uh, REPEC has basically not been funded uh, uh, since its creation in 97 uh, and has uh, almost entirely worked on volu uh, with volunteers and some, uh, some sponsors who would provide infrastructure uh, for, uh, for our uh, websites. So when I when I, I look at uh, how how for example uh, scope has been uh, has been working, one one of the things that has been baffling me is uh, the high cost of this operation, and uh, in some sense uh, it is because uh, you are working with uh, expensive uh, commercial publishers and uh, uh, and I. And the, 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 what I, uh, I'll be saying here is going to be a little bit raining on your parade uh, because I'm going to, to, to uh, say that in some ways you are basically reinforcing the problem that we have with uh, commercial publishers. Because OA policies are basically a sweet deal for publishers. Um, because basically it provides them guaranteed income they don't need to 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 to, to sell uh, sell subscriptions. They're basically APCs that come in and uh, uh, and they get more of that if they accept accept more uh, more articles. So uh, they have a kind of an incentive also to de de dilute the quality of, of, of the journals. They get money up front. Uh, so so the big big amount of money. And uh, right now that they can invest in other in other things, and as we know, they have absolutely gigantic margins. Uh, we know that commercial publishers have really large margins. I mean, everybody talks about the, the margins of over thirty percent of the top ones, but they're even bigger in open access. If you if you just uh, uh, think a little bit about. Uh, the, the, the least expensive of those open access commercial publishers is Hindawi. Um, and Hindawi has more, uh, a profit margin of 50%. And they are the least expensive ones. Um, uh, in, in some, uh, at some point, the, the, the CEO uh, uh, said how much it actually, the true cost, what is the true cost of an article? And uh, he estimates it's about $300. So when 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 I see these 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 costs that are advertised uh, with commercial publishers that are way above that, you can imagine with the kind of um, margins they have for this, um, and uh, and thus even though Scope has uh, uh, says I mean they're, they're at the low end with a thousand dollars, it's actually still a very sweet deal for the for for for, for the publishers that you're working with. And by the way, an article in Oxib costs ten dollars. So, in which way does scope kind of reinforce the problem? Is first of all, you working with these commercial publishers, you 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 make contracts and you drive authors to them. Uh, the the big issue that 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 we have faced is in, in terms of trying to get. Uh, open access uh, more more popular among our academic authors has been that they they say well we don't want to go to new journals right because our promotions our tenure cases are hinging on publishing in the old established high high uh, high impact uh, factor journals and those are typically with a uh, large com uh, commercial publishers so if, if we want to go open access, one avenue was create new journals, right? Uh, societies creating new journals or just uh, some, some local team uh, uh, creating a, a journal. But if, if 
you you you're not encouraging that in any way. You still you actually now challenging the uh, channeling the the authors to the commercial publishers. That makes it much more difficult uh, for open access to to get a foothold. And you at at the same time you're providing this guaranteed income for those publishers, right? And um, which means that the publishers need to do even less in order to attract good, uh, good publications, right? So, so you're really doing all the work for them. You're providing them guaranteed income. It's, it's I mean, it's a fantastic deal for them. And, and you're paying a lot of money for that. And at the same time, your authors have this kind of illusion this is, that this is an awesome system because everything is free for them, right? So, so, so if, if some independent open access uh, endeavor that is really low cost and is only charging $100, say, uh, for an APC or $200, they still view it as being excessively expensive and, and people are not going there. So I, I, I like much more the, uh, the, what I've seen from, from the, the Free the Science Initiative, right? It is really trying to, to get closer to the true costs of things uh, so, so that, I mean, authors still are uh, seeing that there is a cost to OA, but it is much lower than what commercial publishers may make you believe it is. And, um, and uh, indeed, Running a journal nowadays, now that we are in a, uh, all, all aware of the internet and such, that we have uh, o um, uh, open source uh, journal, journal management software and so on, running a journal is now a much less expensive operation than it has ever been. And there's no, no real reason that you, you need to, 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 to go through a commercial publisher. And... Uh, 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 an initiative like Free the Science has also the advantage that it is run by people within the science for the good of that science. Uh, they, they, a commercial publisher does not have the community of scientists in mind. Uh, this had, a commercial publisher has shareholders that, 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 want, uh, that want dividends, right, and is going to try to maximize that. And if at some point a publisher doesn't do well, is making losses and such, it's going, just going to shut down, right? So what's going to happen with all that corpus, right? And uh, so because this, this, this uh, publisher has not been operating in the interest of, uh, of science. Now, of course, uh, something like free the science still has costs and they need to be coming from somewhere, right? So, so you can have uh, the, 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 the model of the APCs, right? Which as I argue can be much lower than they currently are for with commercial publishers. But also uh, the, the societies who typically should be running this, this kind of uh, operation should also think a little bit differently because often uh, they have uh, seen the journals as being uh, revenue generating in order to subsidize the other activities of the society, right? Maybe that model should be reversed. And uh, in economics, there are actually several societies that have reversed that operation. Uh, the most prominent one being the American Economic Association that has, uh, that has a, a, a series of journals that are extremely low costs to the reader, uh, even in print uh, subscriptions, and this is because the the, the general meaning of the uh, of the association is basically subsidizing the the publishing, and one of those journals is open access, fully open access, and uh, without any uh, um, uh, APC. So the, in, also in, in, in terms of a bigger picture, we, we have to think that the publishing industry is in many ways still working in the, in, in the area of print journals. Um, if you just look at how those uh, APCs are, are, are determined, for example, it looks like they depend on things like the number of pages 
that are um, that are in an article. Sciences where articles are longer team, seem to have uh, higher APCs. There's no reason that a PDF of five pages is costing more than a PDF of 20 pages, or uh, less than a PDF of, of 20 pages in, in our age. Um, some charge more for color, even though nothing is getting printed, uh, which, uh, which doesn't make sen any sense either. And uh, actually running a paywall is actually often the mo most expensive item in, 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 in a commercial publisher. It's actually because you have to manage subscriptions, you have to manage who's getting through freely or, or, or not, and so on. So it's actually the paywall that is the expensive part of operations. And if you do away for, uh, with it completely, then you significantly reduce the cost of operations. Uh, so and and this is this is something that is very similar to what you were doing in print, right? Where you, you need to, needed to, to to print things on paper and then distribute that uh, to the authorized people, those who had a subscription. So so it seems to me that uh, with the, the scope initiative, uh, in, in some ways, kind of leads us a little bit on the wrong track because it encourages the the, the commercial publishers to 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 to, to lock down sciences in a particular model with them in a, in a time where actually we, 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 we re realize, we should be realizing that we can do much better without them and, and kind of self-organize within the science, respective sciences uh, in a way that, 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 that be more in the interest of sciences. And libraries here can also help because instead of paying for subscriptions, they could help run some of those journals, right? So if, uh, if you have some, uh, so some society housed within your, your, your campus, you can help that society set up, uh, set up the infrastructure for, for running such a journal. That is my first input. I wonder if I could respond to some of some of Christian's comments. I think it's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. First of all, um, I'd like to say that Scope 3 is not the only initiative that the University of California Libraries or CDL participate in, that we are very supportive of all of the uh, many more transformative efforts that um, both you and Jana and um, uh, Jerry have talked about. In fact, I think we may have been one of the first um, or certainly an early uh, invest uh, participant in ECS Plus, which is supporting open access for with the ECS journals. So we have been um, an absolute supporter of that initiative and many other transformative initiatives, um, as well as running our own publishing initiative through the um, e-scholarship uh, service of the University of, of the uh, California Digital Library, which, which by the way, has just released a new interface today so I hope everyone is going to go to eScholarship.org and look at the beautiful new eScholarship which publishes uh, about 70 journals uh, that are, have an affiliation with the University of California purely open access. So um, we and I are totally with you on the transformative end of the scale. Um, there are a couple of, of factual things that I just wanted to correct about scope three. One is, uh, Christian, I think you said that the publishers get their money up front and they have a guaranteed income. But in fact, um, the publishers are getting their money in arrears as articles are published and they're only paid for the number of articles that are published. So there is an attempt to move the needle, if you will, in the direction of paying publishers as service providers and not providing that kind of guaranteed uh, income or guaranteed revenue. Um, there's also an article, a cap on payments, so that um, there's a negotiated cap that prevents Scope 3 from paying more than a certain level, but we can also pay less if publishing activity is less. So there has uh, been an attempt to manage some of that flow um, um, and, to, and to make it more of a, of a service provision. Um, one of the, um, some of the criticisms that, that you've made, which I don't disagree with, um, have to do with uh, the fact that by um, subventing articles, by not asking authors to pay an APC, we are encouraging con uh, continuation of existing uh, trends. And I think that that's, uh, that criticism is partly aimed at 
not having APC models at all. So as you know, APCs are very controversial. There are many uh, people who feel that AP authors should never have to pay an APC because it's, um, it's you know, the, the, it's some of the challenges that the, our ECS friends have talked about, it's difficult to get uh, authors to pay, um, but it's also requiring them often to dip into grants and so forth. Um, to the extent that scope three is in fact protecting the author from that charge, I think you're right, it's protecting the author from the economic uh, realities of, of costs. And um, some of you, uh, some folks on this webinar might know that the University of California CDL and uh, uh, UC Davis in particular also conducted a study about of APCs uh, a, a year or two ago called the Pay It Forward study, where we looked at what a marketplace for APCs would look like, what the cost implications would be for institutions and some of the ways in which one might create a more competitive uh, level playing field uh, through APCs that might in fact drive costs down. Um, we're you know, still interested in those ideas, but of course there's quite a bit of sentiment that says that that is not the direction that things should go, that there should be more subvention of publication through low cost models. So we're very supportive of those kinds of transformation. At the same time, um, authors are continuing to publish in traditional uh, existing journals. Um, I did also just want to point out, uh, because I know Scope 3 is associated in many people's minds with commercial publishing, and of course uh, Elsevier and Springer are in fact indeed part of that initiative. Uh, Hindawi is also a commercial publisher, but one of what many people can, you know, consider a new lower cost uh, entrant, even though their profitability may be high, their cost basis is very, is very low. All of the other publishers uh, in Scope 3 are uh, nonprofit publishers, uh, Oxford, um, a, a university-based publication out of Poland, um, and two academic societies, IOP and APS. Um, some academic societies also have very, very high profits. So we often associate, or surpluses, we often associate very high profits with commercial publishers, but some of the um, larger and more important academic societies also have extremely high surpluses, in some cases higher than the, than the commercial publishers. So, so I would submit that the, the picture, the overall picture is complex. Um, that in supporting scope three, one of the, our, our goals, or I should say one of, one of my goals and one of scope three's goals is to try and create more momentum around open access to move the literature in that direction. Um, we at CDL and the University of California are also very and uh, equally and perhaps more supportive of transformation. Um, but in supporting scope three, we're really trying to attack the open access conversion problem from both ends of the spectrum, if you will. And I think the point that you make about um, the, the possibility that this is preventing innovation is one that uh, others have made as well and that, that, I, that I do worry about. I think it's something that we have to observe over time. We have to find ways to support innovation and not allow existing structures to be become uh, you know, reified in, in any way. So I think that's something that those of us who are involved with Scope 3 would like to monitor over time. At the same time, many of the preprint servers that exist, um, uh, uh, authors and who are submitting to those servers like Archive are still submitting to traditional journals. So there, there's still a, an incentive that has nothing to do with Scope 3, but that has to do with many factors in the academic and scientific publishing enterprise that are leading uh, uh, scientists and, and authors who are releasing their work at an earlier phase to also submit to a formal journal. Um, and as long as that is the case, we are trying to help open access, help that, that, that entire workflow and process be open access all the way through to the version of record. But I think we all recognize that there are many developments today that are moving in different directions and that we want to support, to, to support as much transformation as possible. So I see scope three as part of a complex uh, uh, ecosystem and positioned at a certain end of that ecosystem. But those of us who are involved with it are also interested and supportive of movement at the other end of the spectrum, if you will. Thanks, Ivy. Yes, uh, definitely we, we recognize a lot of uh, Christian's criticisms and, and agree with them, and, but kudos to both the, the Scope 3 project and Free the Science in, in, in 
taking action to, to try to uh, stem the tide of some of the, uh, the most uh, horrific um, economic uh, aspects of, of, of journal publishing. Would uh, other panelists like to jump in at this point uh, with anything? Or if not, I'll turn it over to maybe our, um, our other listeners have some questions. The chat box does not appear to have any action at the moment. But you're welcome to unmute at this point if you have something of your own. Looks like Madison's got something there. I'm just actually unmuting. You're uh, you're you're breaking up. Uh, could you maybe get closer to the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. I was just unmuting so that um, our guests would have a chance to have um, I guess, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry, I'm um, using my computer mic, so. I, I guess one of the questions I just had is we're actually um, going to be launching our own open access journal um, through open journal systems. And I'm just wondering if anyone has any advice on how to market an open access journal just based on your experience. Advice on marketing. Uh, uh, so we've taken these innovations of the tools that Christian talked about, the capabilities of making uh, things happen uh, at a pretty low budget. But how do you, um, how do you, what's the, what's the subject uh, of, of your journal? What's the focus? So it'll be about uh, library information science. Okay. All right. Any, uh, any of our panelists have any responses to, to marketing, getting that going? Well, I mean that that's the, the the big issue that that putting things in uh, in open access also in terms of institutional repository, right? We we have seen that in institutional repositories don't work so well because participants are not interested uh, in, in disseminating within the university, rather within their field. Right? So every field has usually some 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 community, right? You 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 kind of. And advertise in, in particular conferences or particular venues or, or things like that, where where you can uh, where you mailing lists or something like that, where you you can kickstart things. Uh, and uh, within LIS, right? I mean, there are already some some um, uh, some venues that I, I don't don't spring to my head, but I, I I've seen that there there are the mailing lists. There there's the e list uh, site and and uh, and such where, where you you can get initial traction and it's all and and we've seen that uh, when we we developed repec it's all about getting initial traction in, initial recognition and then things spread by organically it's, it's just the initial seed that you need and after that it's it, it, it's right itself yeah, I've often thought that it's uh, important to um, sort of cultivate uh, an authorship. So to to seek out um, folks who have an established reputation. Uh, we're trying to shed uh, impact factor as a measure, but perhaps if that street cred at least is in place, to uh, to carry that across to increase. Um, in the new environment, uh, like the street cred of it. So, thank you. Anybody else? Or, or so, so the ECS is a collection of electrochemists and solid state scientists and so forth. So, so we have a built in body of people who are inherently interested in the topic and we meet, we have meetings. So we go pretty regularly. We know each other. Is there an analogous type event that that's in, in, in your topical area? Um, it will be mostly based on submissions from students in the MLIS program here at Western. So we have that kind of that built-in community. So I think we can definitely use that. Does the community extend beyond the campus? Is there a way to promote that? I think 
think we might start small for now. So um, definitely getting our authorship and readership going with the community will be first. There are indeed, John, some uh, some opportunities for conferences. There, there, uh, there are several, and in, in fact, that was my uh, reason for kind of putting uh, our panelists together. Was looking at what was going on in our sort of national organization and looking at the OA, um, uh, the lack of OA opportunities, even just within our own professional society, and um, looking at how. What the budget reports from these folks usually tends to say, well, we, we broke even and we're happy with that, and contrasting that with, uh, with let's say, commercial publishers where we're pushing 30% profit and things, to say that maybe this would be an area um, where, where OA models uh, could get more traction as opposed to just a full frontal assault on, on Elsevier or something. But anyway. just be careful if Elsevier identifies it as something worthy, you will have a new problem. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, go over our, our time budget too much. I was interested in asking John one more question about uh, the relationship between patents as intellectual property and publishing, and she had agreed to maybe address that if we had time. It, it, can you give us a quick answer? Surely. So, so the, the basic idea of what happens in an academic institution and what happens in a patent environment, they're a little bit at odds with each other. So, so in an academic environment, you want to go and publish in journals and you want to do that as quickly and as timely as possible to get your, your name stamped on it. In the patent situation, you want to go forth and you want to put the information into the patent literature with the purpose of you know, having an opportunity for economic development for those ideas and to establish the ideas as novel. And um, there's there's timing issues. So if you if you publish in a journal before you put it in the patent literature, then then your rights to the patent are pr pretty much you know disabled um, worldwide. And and all the rules even in the U.S. have changed within recent within recent years. So so they're kind of a dichotomous and not very well coordinated um, approach to what to do with your research output. Um, and so open access. Um, it, it, in and of itself is is not necessarily any different in terms of how it impacts folks who are trying to do both patents and and regular literature but it has all the normal problems associated with it, it doesn't provide any advantages to dealing with this dichotomous approach to things, so we get there were an answer well, well well thank you for for addressing it um i think we better close are there any final lingering questions. I don't see any and I don't see any more chat. So I just want to thank our panelists. So Ivy, Jana, Jerry, and Christian. Thank you very much, especially for your your fresh honesty <laughs> and uh, and the perspectives that you all uh, brought. And I wish you to have a great day and I